there is a There is a name by which I am saved. Salvation is your Good evening. I'm so glad to see so many of you online and welcome again to the webinar, Jesus in Conflict, Jerusalem. My name is Agnes. I'm a Crew Singapore staff currently serving in East Asia School of Theology. Many of you joined us last week for Dr. Keith's webinar on the footprints of Jesus in Galilee. And we are encouraged to hear that you have learned many new things or something new from Dr. Keith's teaching. Dr. Keith is with us tonight again, um, both on video as well as live in person. So Dr. Keith, would you like to say a few words to our participants online and um, what we can be expecting tonight? Yes, I'm looking forward tonight. And by the way, Shalom. We're going to be looking through Jerusalem and the problems that Jesus had when he was there. And tomorrow night, we're going to end up at the cross, and we're going to explain what happened at the cross. So I'm looking forward to the questions you give me tonight, and uh, we'll interact well, I think. Dr. Keith, we are also very excited that you, have, um, that you are here with us, and we're excited that so many of you have chosen to spend tonight and tomorrow night learning about the life of our Lord Jesus, in particularly the conflicts that he faced while in Jerusalem. This two-part webinar is one of the many webinars offered by Crew Singapore and East Asia School of Theology in celebration of their 50th and 30th anniversary, respectively. Let me introduce Reverend Dr. Keith Schubert for some of us who are new to his webinar tonight. Dr. Keith has been in ministry for more than 50 years. He has taught in three seminaries as resident faculty for the last 45 years. He is a New Testament professor who is well-loved by his students for his insightful and faithful interpretation of God's word. In addition, Dr. Keith also spent three years in Jerusalem studying the geographical, archaeological, and historical facts of ancient Israel. He and his wife, Dr. Jeanette, have led more than 15 study trips for students, faculty, as well as church groups to Israel in the last two decades. We are privileged to hear from Dr. Keith tonight, both via a pre-recorded video as well as live in person during the Q&A segment. So tonight, we will do this um, um, format in our webinar. We'll have two parts, and um, then there'll be a Q&A segment after every video. So altogether tonight, we'll be see, watching two videos, and after which we'll have a Q&A se uh, session. This is when Dr. Keith will help to answer some of your questions related to what you have learned from the videos. If you have questions you would like to ask, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Type in your question anytime during the webinar and Dr. Keith will try to answer them as many related questions as possible. Okay, well, we, uh, I think we're all ready to begin. Let me just pray for us before we hand the time over to Dr. Keith. Shall we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to learn together. And thank you, Lord, for Dr. Keith, who's willing to uh, share with us some of his wisdom and what he has been learning. We pray that you prepare our hearts to receive the messages and the, and the teaching that you have, that you want to deposit in our lives today. And today we pray that you, <clears throat> you will uh, watch over the technical details, and I pray that today's webinar will go smoothly, and we ask you bless all our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. When we talk about the life of Christ, 
we often divided into two geographical areas, Galilee and Jerusalem. In Galilee, Jesus has a much more normal type ministry. He does not have very much conflict. He spends a lot of time with disciples, developing his disciples. He goes around the region speaking in different synagogues. Many of those were actually home synagogues, as we think in terms of home churches we're coming from. And he has not so much opposition. When he has opposition, it often comes from Jerusalem, but that's Galilee. When you come to Jerusalem, there's always trouble. At least it seems that way. Now you remember, whether you live in Jerusalem, Judea, or even uh, Galilee or elsewhere, according to the law, you should attend three major feasts every year. So if Jesus is one who keeps the law, and he was, he would then be required to come to Jerusalem three times a year for the fest, uh, particular feast or festivals. And often we will read, and Jesus decided to go to a particular feast, and when he's in Jerusalem, now this happens. We're going to talk about, in this session and some sessions that follow, the life of Jesus in Jerusalem. And when that happens, you should think of conflict. Let me give you some of the background material that will help you understand from where this conflict came. Jesus in Jerusalem in conflict. Here is the way we put together Jesus' ministry. First year, public ministry. Basically in Galilee. He's going around presenting himself. I am the Messiah. He's presenting himself as a prophet but he demonstrates that his message is from God by the miracles that he does. So often you will see him preaching and teaching and healing. After the first year of his public ministry, we have the R where he is rejected. The nation of Israel will officially reject him as the Messiah. This happens based upon the Sanhedrin. We'll talk about that in a second. The second two years, year two and year three, is his private ministry. He will not go to the multitudes anymore. Uh, he will train his disciples in a private way. Often he will heal somebody and say, don't go tell anybody. Or he will limit the crowd so that they would not see what he was doing. His focus is much more on the disciples and training them as opposed to presenting himself to the nation Israel. However, even though that is not much conflict there, from time to time, he goes to Jerusalem. So here's the what really happens. You have here and here, and every so often he has to take a trip to Jerusalem. And when he does, you can expect conflict. And conflict's gonna come in two forms. Now it was on the Sabbath. Well, he does things on the Sabbath that they don't like. And he also claims to be God. And of course, they don't like that either. Let me give you some background. Three important concepts. First of all, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the Jewish council that constitutes the highest Jewish authority at that time of Jesus. It's composed of two groups, the Pharisees, Sadducees. The Pharisees are the majority way of thinking. They are the minority of the people in the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees, they're the majority in the Sanhedrin, but they are the minority. You say, I, I, I hear the Pharisees all the time, but I don't hear so much about the Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees are composed of the people who are maintaining the temple. And so when it says the chief priests, those would be the Sadducees. The Sadducees, we say they didn't believe in the miraculous, so they were Sadducees. They are liberal. They don't accept angels, they don't accept miracles, they don't believe in the oral law. They will accept some of the written law, but there are laws about the laws. And these laws about the laws, which they still have today, it's called halakha today, it, the Bible is called tradition of the elders. There was these laws that help you keep the laws that Moses gave. And they were considered, that is the tradition of the elders, considered even more important. In fact, they were so 
much from God that they weren't even, they were so holy that they were not even put in writing. That's why they're the oral law. They believed in annihilation. That is, when you die, you die like a dog or an animal. There's no soul after death. So therefore, they don't believe in the resurrection as well. These are important concepts, and some of them we're going to come up to in the next uh, few minutes. Now, the Pharisees. This is the majority religious view, and this is important because, actually, many of the disciples have picked up the thoughts and the values of the, of the Pharisees. They believe the tradition of the elders, and it's the tradition of the elders that Jesus is going to go against when he heals on the Sabbath. They believe in judgment. They believe in life after death. We would probably agree with them in that. They believed in salvation by works, and you keep these oral laws. And they, very important, they believe that the physical is an indicator of the spiritual. For instance, and one of the things we're going to come to, a man born blind. The question is, he obviously is blind. That's a result of sin. So, the Pharisees would discuss this. If a man's born blind, who sinned, he before he was born, or his parents that caused him to be born blind? So anytime you have somebody sick, injured, something wrong with him physically, that means there's sin in their life. That would be their position. And so those that were healthy were spiritual. Those that were wealthy were spiritual. And the Pharisees, the leaders of the Pharisees, were healthy and wealthy. These concepts are important to know because as we come into the conflict, these values that the Sadducees, that the Pharisees have, will come into conflict to what Jesus is teaching. So, conflict in Jerusalem. Now, here's Jerusalem today. I am standing on the Mount of Olives. You go way down this valley, and then the long wall that you see there is the base of where the temple was. And here is a model of it. The, as you see, the big building in the background, that was the largest building in the world at that time. Most people thought it was the most significant most beautiful as well. Now, if you look carefully to the left of the building, in the back, it looks like there are four towers. That's called the Antonius, after Mark Antony. And Herod built that as well. That's where you have the Roman soldiers to watch over what might happen there in the temple. These dynamics will be important for us as we study the Gospels, also as we study Acts and a little bit of the epistles as well. Now here's a continuation of the model. You can see how big it is today. And the, the walls are still there. The temple, of course, is not. You can put up to 500,000 people in there at one time, which they have had uh, in the last few years. The temple. Now, when you say, did Jesus go to the temple? The answer is yes and no. He went to the temple complex, and that was fine for everybody to go. But if you want to go into the temple, the small temple, this is the building that you see inside the big area, that's a different Greek word for temple. And only the priest and then into the Holy of Holies, the high priest could go. And Jesus never went into that. That would have been against the law to do. Now you see in the back the Antonius and the towers of there. A little bit closer picture. Now I'm in the southern steps of the Temple Mount, and if you look in the back, you can see a ravine, very deep, and then it comes up. This is an extension of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, we know it, will be a little bit out of the picture to the left. This is called today the Hill of Offense. Solomon, when he had all of his wives, did not want his wives to worship real close to where Jehovah was worshiped. So he built temples for them up there on the Hill of Offense. And it was those temples that brought offense to the Old Testament. Now I'm in the valley. It's called the Kidron Valley. And I'm looking clear up there to the left. And that's the Golden Gate. Just to give you a little bit of flavor of where we are. Now the Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And this is the first incident we have of him that we have written. 
And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, money changers seated on all the tables. And this is a common story when he cleansed the temple. He made a scourge of the cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the coins, money changers, overturned the tables. Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of business. Who's going to be upset with him? The common people are going to praise him. They recognize that they are being taken advantage of. Who's taking advantage of them? Those that control the temple. That is the Sadducees. This is where they make their money. When you saw real nice houses in the pictures I showed you, those were Sadducee houses. And the Sadducees are going to be upset with them. He says, my, this is my father's house. This is not a house of business or where we make money. The Jews then said, and every time we come to the Jews, we say, who are the Jews? Well, we're not talking about the Jewish nation. We're talking about the Jewish leaders. And that would be your Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin. And they say, what sign do you show that you have an authority for doing these things? And he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. This word of sign, this word authority are key words. Jesus will do a lot of signs which indicate that he is the Messiah. The Jews will say, he's doing all these signs. But when they talk to him publicly in front of other people, they say, what sign will you show us? What authority? Why did you do? What, who gave you the authority to disrupt what we're doing in the temple? Remember, he spoke with authority. When he was in Galilee, he acted with authority. Now, when he was in Jerusalem and Passover and the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs that he was doing. We're going to see a number of times, even when he's in Jerusalem, that many people believe. There's a lot of believers. And we believe that these were true believers, not just general followers, people liked listening to a message, but those that came to worship that truly believed in him. That's going to be a concern for the Sanhedrin we're going to see. They observed the signs which he was doing. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, what did he do? He left Judea. He went away to Galilee. He moved away from the conflict. We're going to see this pattern happen a number of times. Matthew records really the same thing. He says, now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he settled, he set up his headquarters at Capernaum, which is by the sea. He moves to Galilee to get away, not only from the pressure of the Jews, but the pressure of the, the Roman rulers. Remember, John had been taken into custody, that's John the Baptist, and will die under uh, King Herod. So he goes to Galilee where he's safe from that as well. After these things, there was a feast in Ju of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You think, uh-oh, going to be some more trouble. You're right. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, which is just behind that uh, Antonius, there is in the Hebrew Bethesda five porticos. And there was a man there that had been there for 38 years. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? The man would say, of course, but I've been here 38 years. And when the angel comes to stir the water, I'm never the first one. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet, walk. And he does so, picks up his pallet and walks. Now, it was a Sabbath. Ah, this is the trouble. Not what he did, but he did it on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work. If you're a farmer, you're not supposed to plant. You're not supposed to harvest. If you sell merchandise, you're not to have your shop open. If you sell, make bread, you can't bake bread on the Sabbath. If you're a physician, you can't heal on the Sabbath. Jesus is a physician. He's acting like a physician. He heals on the Sabbath. This is the problem. So the Jews were saying to the man, that is the Jewish leaders, who's cured, it's the Sabbath. It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. See, that is a burden, and you can't carry loads or burdens on the Sabbath. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders persecuted him because he's doing these things. But he said, my father is working till now. I myself am working. Now, let's not let's go over this too fast. Because he says, God in heaven works on the Sabbath. And since I'm God, I can work on the Sabbath as well. Well, that's going to cause some more problems. 
For this reason, the Jews were seeking to, more kill, to kill him. Why? Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, that's one reason, but he was calling God his own father that makes himself equal with God. So why are they trying to kill him? Number one, he breaks the Sabbath. Number two, he's claiming that he is God. You see, the Sanhedrin are not going to like them. If you are Sadducee, he's claiming to be God. That doesn't work. If you are Pharisee, this man is claiming to be God, but he's not a Pharisee. If you're going to be God, if you're going to be a Messiah, you've got to be a Pharisee, of course. And there's all kinds of problems. Remember, the headquarters for the Pharisees, the headquarters of the Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin all were in Jerusalem. So he goes to the very uh, headquarters of uh, these individuals when he makes these kinds of comments. And after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. Why did he go to Galilee? For he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, he's in Galilee. Okay, not so much of a problem. Now, the Feast of the Booths was near. He got to go back to Jerusalem again. And now you know the story. You go to Jerusalem, conflict. And if you ever hear the phrase, on the Sabbath, you know the story. So Jesus said to them, this, this is his brothers, I'm not giving you all the context. He says, I will not go up to the feast because my time has not fully come. So the brothers went. He stayed in Galilee. Then when his brothers had gone up to the feast, he himself went up, but in secret. People did not know that he was gone. Remember, there would be tens of thousands of people going on the same road and he could keep himself in secret and people not know who he was. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast. They know that he comes every one, uh, three times a year to each of the three feasts. They're looking for him. They're saying, where is he? There was much grumbling from the crowd concerning him. Some would say he's a good man. Others would say, no, he leads people astray. But they were not speaking only openly of him for fear of the Jews. See, they were very afraid of what the Jews could do, especially the Pharisees could do to them as they related to their synagogue. We're going to come to a story where we're going to put this into place. So we'll take a break now with some questions and discuss why all of this conflict occurs when he's in Jerusalem. This is very different than when he's in Galilee. All right, I think this is a great time to take uh, questions from the floor or from the audience. And uh, from my screen, I can actually see two questions right now, um, but feel free to continue to send in your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, Dr. Keith, would you like to um, answer this question for us? I think um, someone in the audience asked, could you please explain the difference between the oral law and the tradition of the elders, or are they the same? Dr. I'm going to add another term, halakha, and let me explain. Tradition of the elders is going to be a phrase that you see from time to time in the New Testament. That is gotten from the Bible. The oral law is what we explain, how we explain it. In other words, it's a word from, or two words from today. So what I'm saying here is that tradition of the elders and what we call oral law is the same thing. Let me explain why we call it oral law. In the Old Testament, Moses says you cannot do several things. In fact, there's a lot of things you can't do. You cannot work on the Sabbath. You cannot start a fire in the Sabbath. You cannot walk more than a certain distance on the Sabbath. These were written laws. Now, as time went on, the Jews took those laws and they made oral laws that that fit around those uh, written laws. Now, oral laws would be, we want to make sure that you don't even come close to disobeying the laws of Moses. So these were the oral laws. 
uh, it's like if you walk next to a cliff, you don't want to see how close you can get to the cliff before you fall off. You need to walk a distance away. So that part was good. But as time went on, people began to believe that keeping the oral law, this laws about the laws, would be a way to work your way to heaven. And of course, there's all kinds of problems with that. For instance, you cannot build a fire on the Sabbath. There's a certain amount of work in that. Now, in Numbers 15, they caught a guy picking up wood, which you can't do as well, to build a fire, which you can't do. But he picked up wood and carried a burden on the Sabbath. Now, oral law says, well, what is a burden? They began to think that through. You can't carry a burden on the Sabbath. What about your clothes? Well, no, no, let me think. Clothes cannot be a burden. So clothes are not a burden. But what about a handkerchief? According to oral law, you cannot wear a, a, take a handkerchief because it's not really clothes. That is a burden. And if you wear, uh, take a handkerchief with you, then you are uh, breaking the law. But what happens if you are sick? And you, you got a cold. Well, if you wear a suit jacket, you can take, uh, put a pin in your suit jacket and connect the uh, handkerchief to it. And then when you want to wipe your nose, then you can pull it up and do that and then put it down. And that's okay because it is part of your clothes at that point. Another example. You cannot light, light a fire on the Sabbath. But today in Israel, that means you cannot turn on a light on the Sabbath because when a light is turned on, there's a little spark and that is a fire. So you cannot open your refrigerator on the Sabbath because you've got a light in there and that turns the light on. However, if Friday afternoon before the Sabbath comes, if you unscrew the light bulb, then when you open the refrigerator, the light doesn't go on, and that is okay. Those are the laws around the laws. That is why today as well, you can't drive your car on the Sabbath, because when you turn the key in the ignition, there's a little spark. Now, you have a third term called halakha. It's from halak, which means walking. And this is your walk, walk in connection with the Old Testament law. And that is the way it's referred today in modern Hebrew. So tradition of the elder is the biblical term. Oral law is what we look at. And I sort of described that a little bit. And halakha then is what you would hear if this is talked about in Israel. Ah, I see another question. It's a question about Hades. Is it another? Okay. It's a question about Pharisees. Uh, okay, Pharisees. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Pharisees, they wore purple. Purple is uh, a sign of extreme wealth. Sadducees, they're well-dressed and they're rich. We know that the Sadducees from the uh, homes that they had that we have excavated. They're all around the temple. Tremendous uh, homes you know, 10, 15, 20 rooms in a house, maybe two or three stories high. We would call it a palace or a mansion. They call it home. Question is, where did they get so much money? I am not sure I can answer that in relationship to the Pharisees. Maybe some of the Pharisees had what we would call old money. I don't know that. However, we do know where the money came for the Sadducees because they control the temple. The chief priest and the priest were the Sadducees. And they would, uh, as they exchange money, make a tremendous amount of money that way. For instance, if you came from, uh, say, Rome, or you came from Spain, you obviously could not bring your own lamb to sacrifice. You, If you did, then something might go wrong. It might get lamp, and then you got a problem. So you would go with some money, and then you need to buy your lamb there in Jerusalem. 
Well, the lambs that are declared clean and acceptable all belong to the Sadducees. And so if a normal lamb is called, uh, cost $20, for instance, they would charge you $80. And you don't have a choice. You got to buy that. When you come, you also have to pay the temple tax. And that's so many shekels, or that's a half shekel, for instance. But you don't have shekels in Rome. You don't have shekels in Spain. So you have to uh, pay for it uh, at your money changers. It's like, uh, like today. If I come with three U.S. dollars, I can get four Singapore dollars. But maybe if it's back then, I would come from Spain and I need four Singapore dollars to pay that tax. They may charge me 30 US dollars for that four. They charge tremendous amount. They would make a great deal off the common, very poor people. And that's why when Jesus chastised the money changers in the temple, when he cleansed the temple and he did it twice, the common people were very happy to see that. The Sadducees were not. Uh, another question. Were the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the Old Testament? Uh, maybe. Uh, at the very end, Malachi's time, there may be the very beginning of especially the Pharisees, not so much the Sadducees. You said that the Sadducees were the priests. Yes. They became that, and they became thinking that, between the 400 years of the Old Testament and to the beginning of the New Testament period of time. We forget sometimes that 400 years is very, it's a long time. Look where we are in Singapore. 400 years ago is what? Well, there wasn't really so much happening back then compared to what's happening now. Were the Pharisees and the Sadducees descendants of Levitic, uh, Levites? The answer is yes and no. The Pharisees were not. The Sadducees traced their descendants back to the Levites. That would be true. What happened to the Levites? Next question. Pharisees and Sadducees from the Levite tribe. No, uh, the Sadducees were. What happened to the Levites? The, okay, let me define terms a little bit in the Old Testament. Levites was anybody from the tribe of Levi. From there, a number of the Levites became priests, not everybody. And from there, a select number, usually one a year, would become the high priest. Remember the story of the Samaritan. And he goes down and he is injured by some robbers. Who came by? A priest came by, also a Levi. That would be somebody from the tribe of Levi, but would not be a priest. All right, one more question, maybe a couple more questions, actually. I recognize that Jesus is always in conflict with the Jewish leaders. Most of the time, that's true. But Christ is also God, and he came to fulfill the law. If he came to fulfill the law, why is he in conflict with the law of teachers? Ah, pretty good question. Again, this is an answer of yes and no. That's my favorite answer. Uh, let me explain. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And really, he did. He filled, fulfilled the law as it was written in the Old Testament. That is the law uh, written down by Moses. But this oral law, which would be all the traditions around that written law, those he did not keep. He would break their definition of the Sabbath. He would not break Moses' definition of the Sabbath. Now, when you ask to fulfill the law, that's a little bit different question. He came and he lived under the law. He lived a holy life. Remember, he grew up with a religious family that went to synagogue regularly. He would go regularly to the, the feasts that were required in Jerusalem. But the law was written for the purpose of explaining that man is sinful. Now, when it says Jesus fulfilled the law, he came to provide the solution to man's sin. 
Here's the illustration I use. One time I was very sick. I had infectious and in, uh, well, I was just sick and I thought I had the flu. And I went to the doctor. He says, you have the flu. And I said, great. He says, what do you do? You, you go home and you drink some more and drink a lot and call me the next day. So I called him the next day and he says, Keith, you do not have the flu. And I knew he was wrong. So I said, no, I think you're wrong, doc. And he says, okay, maybe I'm wrong. Go to the mirror, tell me what color are the whites of your eyes. And I went, I looked and they were yellow. And I came back and I said, doc, what must I do to be saved? What happened? Once I was convinced that I was wrong, now I search for the solution. That's the purpose of the law. It explains that God is holy, very, very holy. Man is sinful, extremely sinful. This book of Leviticus, by the way. And the distance between God and man is so great, you can't even imagine it. If that's the problem, what's the solution? Solution is by faith, and that's what Jesus came. So when it says Jesus came to fulfill the law, to bring the law to the logical conclusion, is there another question? At that time, have they gotten the entire Old Testament or just a few books of the Old Testament? At the time of Jesus, they only had 22 books. We have 39. But that is as they counted them. First and Samuel, second Samuel was one. First and second Kings was one. Uh, the 12 minor prophets was one. And so when you count it up that way, the 22 and the 39 that we have are all the same. So in that sense, they had the entire Old Testament. They referred to them as the law and the prophets or the law and the writings and the prophets, as we refer to the New Testament as gospels and the epistles. Thank you, Dr. Keith. Maybe we can take uh, more questions after our second video. And uh, keep your questions coming. They are great stuff. And I think because of your questions, we are learning even more than what, uh, what maybe just the video has uh, to show us. So keep your questions coming. And Dr. Keith will have another Q&A session after video part two. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this video. Let us continue talking about the life of Christ. Remember, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, Jesus anticipates conflict and he's never disappointed. So we're talking about the life of Christ, Jesus in Jerusalem, and thus in conflict. Let's take just a moment to review his ministry, his three years here on life. We talked about the public ministry that he had. And then during the private ministry, from time to time, he goes to Jerusalem. And we see that happening. John will give us a lot of the detail of the problems that he has in Jerusalem. Chapter 9, verse 1. And he passed by. He's in Jerusalem now. And he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples said, Rabbi. That's important. The disciples considered him a rabbi, a one that's teaching them. And they asked him the, the questions that the Pharisees had. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? If you're a Pharisee, Obviously, a man born blind has sinned a great deal. Who, did, who sinned? For what is the cause of this sin? Maybe the man sinned even before he was born. Some Pharisees thought that. Some of the Pharisees said, well, this is really on the parents, and the parents sinned. But the bottom line is, somebody sinned because this man was born blind. Now, who asked this question? It was the disciples. The disciples had picked up the, this particular value of the Pharisees. And Jesus says, it wasn't this man who sinned. It wasn't his parents who sinned. It was for a different reason, that God would be glorified. When he said this, he spat on the ground, made clay from the spittle, applied it to his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went away, washed and came back seen. Now, this happened in the temple, but the pool of Siloam, is about 10 blocks away. And here's a man that's blind, was told to go wash your eyes in the place where people are going and getting water to drink. They're taking it back to their home to have water during the day. That was their running water. They would run to get water and bring it back. 
And he's supposed to wash his face in that. And he makes his way down to the pool. That would have taken, what, several hours, I don't know. And washed, and then he came back, seen. By that time, of course, Jesus is gone. So they brought the, to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Not, now it was on the Sabbath. Now it's a big problem. Then the Pharisees were also asking him again, how did you receive sight? And he said to them, oh, this guy applied clay to my eyes. I washed and I went and saw. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Other Pharisees were saying, how can a man who's a sinner performs its sign. And there was a division even among the Pharisee, trying to figure out how can somebody who's not a Pharisee and doesn't keep the Sabbath form such a miracle. And we're going to see how big a miracle this really is. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say? The blind man says, I think he's a prophet. Remember, at this point, the man has not seen Jesus. The Jews did not believe him. So they go and check with his parents. They called his parents. He says, are you the parents? Yes. Was this man born blind? Yes. How does he see? Now, the parents answer him says, we know that this is our son. That's right. We know he's born blind. That's right. But he sees now. We don't know. Ask him. He's old enough. Why did the parents not answer? This will tell us the fear that the common people had over the Jewish leaders, or from the Jewish leaders. His parents said, because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed, if anyone confessed Jesus to be the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Now the word term, put out of the synagogue, is what we would say to be excommunicated. Now if you were out of the synagogue, excommunicated, that means you really can't have a job. Everybody who knows that you are put out of the synagogue, they will not buy your products. Uh, you won't have a place to live. It is a tremendous problem to be put out of the synagogue. And that was one of the clubs that the uh, Pharisees were able to use to keep people in their place. It is for this reason, the parents said, he's of age, ask him. They don't want to be put out of the synagogue. But the man will say, when they go back to him, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anybody opened the eyes of a person born blind. You know what they're saying? This guy is saying, and it's absolutely correct, Jesus did a number of miracles that other people did in the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, etc. But no one in the Old Testament ever healed a man that was born blind. Only Jesus did that. Because it wasn't a matter of healing a particular illness, it's a matter of making eyes when there's no eyes. The man said, if this man were not from God, he couldn't do anything. They answered him, said, you were born in your sins and you're teaching it. You're teaching us. They put him out of the synagogue. They excommunicated him. At this point, the man has not seen Jesus yet. Let's continue the story. But remember this, this is the type of miracle that has never occurred before in history of the world. And a division arose among the Jews because of the words. Many of them said, he's a demon. He's insane. Others said, a demon is not one who opened the eyes of the blind. Can he? So there's confusion about who he was. And now we're not in chapter 9 anymore. We're in chapter 10 of John. And this is the Good Shepherd uh, discussion. But again, all of these things from chapter 9 and the problem that there was when he healed the, the man that was born blind are going to continue in chapter 10 and in chapter 11 as well. This particular miracle will not be forgotten. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. Okay, Jesus is now back in Jerusalem then, isn't it? And the Jews come and say, if you are the Messiah, the Christ, the word Christ is, is the word Messiah. If it's transliterated, it's translated from Christos to Christ. If it's translated, it's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. If you are the Messiah, Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, you don't believe me. I and the Father are one. Remember, this is one of the reasons, of the two reasons, one of the two reasons Jesus creates conflict. Because he heals on the Sabbath, because he's his own Father. And the Jews picked up stones to stone him again. Jesus says, well, I've done many good things. Why do you stone me? The Jews said, the Jewish leaders, for good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, Make yourself out to be God. That is very clear. Sometimes we have people say, well, 
Jesus never really claimed to be God. But here, it's obvious. For good work, we don't stone you. But for you being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now, any man in his right mind would say, no, 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 you're going to kill me for that. That's not what I'm claiming. Jesus didn't do that. They got it right. Therefore, they were seeking to seize him again. In other words, they tried to arrest him, and he got away. But later on the chapter, there's another discussion. And he went away beyond the Jordan to a place which John was first baptizing. He was staying there. He goes beyond the Jordan. He goes out of the hot area, so to speak, where he's safe. And the result of that, many believed in him there. Later on, there'll be another feast. He'll have to go back to Jerusalem again. And now we see them walking back to Jerusalem. On the way, he's going to condemn the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money. Why? Well, we all love money, I know. But for them, it's a sign of how spiritual they were. If you have a million, but I have 10 million, I'm 10 times more spiritual than you are. They were listening to all these things, and they were ridiculing Jesus. He said, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people, but God knows your hearts because it is that which uh, highly esteemed among people is detestable in the sight of God. Again, you have the Pharisees arguing with Jesus and, and debating some of this theology. Jesus goes and he points out another very uh, sensitive area. See, the Pharisees had all kinds of rules based upon Deuteronomy 24 where they could divorce their wife. Some even said if she uh, burnt the soup, or even if she did not look good one day, you could divorce your wife and marry another. And Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife, marries another, commits adultery. He who marries a woman that is divorced commits adultery. This is not really a discussion on divorce. This is a discussion on remarriage. And Jesus is telling the disciples, all remarriage is sin. I know that brings up questions, which maybe we'll talk about another day. But right after that, there's a very important passage. Now there was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple, fine lemon, linen, enjoying himself in the splendor every day. Ah, that's your Pharisee. See, purple is very expensive. If you buy a cloak that is green or a cloak that's red. You could wash it several times and it would still be green or red. But they could not find a purple permanent dye. And then finally it was discovered. This will bring you to Acts where it says the lady who sold purple. She, in other words, she was a high-end type of business. But what you did this way, you go to the seashells that were very common in the Mediterranean. And you would take apart that particular seashell. In there, there'd be a stomach. If you take the skin around the stomach and you put it aside, when you've done that to 10,000 of these, then you have enough for a permanent purple dye. You could dye one uh, piece of cloth. That's why purple is associated with kings, because only kings could have purple. Now, this man is so rich. He dresses with purple every day. Fine linen, wonderful food. Wow, Pharisee, you would say. What a spiritual, godly man. He's contrasted with a poor man by the name of Lazarus was laid at his gate. He couldn't even walk there. He was laid there. He's covered with sores. He longs to be fed with the scraps that fall from the rich man's table. Not only that, but the dogs come and are licking his sores. You, have, you don't have a rich man, poor man. You have rich, very, very rich, and poor, extremely poor. And one, if you're a Pharisee, you understand, is very, very spiritual. The other one is a very, very complete sinner. He's done all kinds of sins. Now, the story continues. They both die, and they go to the place of death. Let me talk to you about the geography of Hades. Hades is considered the center part of the earth. That's the way they viewed it. It's divided into three parts. One part is hell. That is where you would have flames. People were suffering. You would have a place called Abraham's bosom. It's also called paradise. And if you were godly, you would go to Abraham's bosom. If you were ungodly, you would go to hell. 
and in between there is a gulf. So in this story you could talk across but you can't walk across. This was the concept by the way in the Old Testament as well. Old Testament they referred to this as shale. The Hebrew word is shale and it always talks about going down to shale. Now you say is it really in the center part of the earth? Well no because it's another dimension. We would not say that if you got a shovel and you dug for a long time that you could get there. But then we would also refer to heaven as up and we wouldn't say that if you got into rocket and you go the right direction you go to heaven. It's another dimension. This is just the way they uh, looked at it. Now the rich man very very spiritual. The poor man, Lazarus, very, very sinful. But when they get into the shale, in Abraham's bosom, it is Lazarus who's there. It is the Pharisee who is in torment. And the Pharisee says, I request you, Father Abraham, that you send to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that you may warn them not to come to this place. But Abraham said, they have Moses, they have the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets are the way that they looked at the Old Testament. Moses was written, wrote the first five books. The prophets were the rest of the Old Testament. Sometimes they would refer to him as Moses, the writings, and the prophets. Similar to what we do with the New Testament when we talk about the Gospels or the Epistles. We're talking about groups of books. They did the same thing. He says they have the Old Testament. Learn from the Old Testament. And he says, no father Abraham, but if someone would go to them from the dead, they would repent. And he said to them, if they did not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises again from the dead. Now you might say, this is a very interesting story. How does it relate? Well, it relates in this way. This is the only story only parable that we know of in entire scripture where Jesus uses a personal name. It's often if a certain person does this or if a lady does this or if a farmer does this but he uses somebody's name and I don't think that's a coincidence because the next thing that happens is John 11. A certain man was sick, Lazarus. I think Jesus knew what was coming up he is going to use this story to communicate that even if somebody would come back from the dead, they wouldn't listen to him. You say, well, Jesus, no, we're going to talk about Lazarus coming back from the dead. Now, there's a certain man who was sick. We're in chapter 11 of John now. Lazarus of Bethany, a village of Mary, sister Martha. And you know the story. He got sick. He was going to die and eventually did die. And they sent to Jesus, who was just beyond Jericho on the other side of the Jordan River. And they said, come up and heal him. And Jesus says, well, we'll wait. Then he decides two days later, let's go up to Judea again. The disciples said to him, what? Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. You're going back there again. The conflict is so much so that every time that Jesus goes back to Jerusalem now, he can expect that they're going to try to arrest him and kill him. The people understood that. The disciples understood that. And the disciples said, they're trying to kill you. And you're going back there again? And he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm going to wake him up. But I go that I may wake him up. They said, if he's going to sleep, that's fine. He's resting. He said, no, Lazarus is dead. Therefore, Thomas, who's called Didymus. Didymus is the word for twin. That was his nickname, the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us go also so that we may die with him. Thomas is willing to go with Jesus knowing he's going to die because they're going to Jerusalem. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, about three kilometers off, we would say. But I showed you the, the Mount of Olives. Just on the other side of that is where Bethany is. So to come Bethany, you would have to climb up to the top of the mountain, which wasn't very far, and then cross it and go down again to get to Jerusalem. Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha, consoling the two ladies because of their brother. Jesus arrives and he weeps. The Jews were saying this. See how he loved him. 
But some were saying, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? They remember the, the healing of the man born blind. That is still in their mind. They still attribute that to him. That is such a phenomenal miracle. The man who had died, Lazarus came forth, bound hand and foot, and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what he had done, what Jesus had done in healing Lazarus, and they believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Now let's stop here for just a second and think about this. Now let me talk with uh, Lazarus a little bit. I said, Lazarus, what did you do last week? Well, last week I, I died and I was, how long did you die? Well, I was four days and then I came back to life again. Jesus brought me back to life. I said, oh, what was it like? Well, I died and I went to Abraham's bosom, but there was a gulf in between and then other people over here in torment. I said, okay, first question. Did you see my mom? Yeah, she's there. She's doing fine. In fact, she's enjoying. Next question. Did you see Pharisees there? Ah, uh, yes, there was a number of Pharisees, but they were in the other side. He would have a testimony. And you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus said, even if somebody would go back from the dead, they wouldn't believe him. Now they have somebody going back from the dead. Will they believe him? And the story continues. Therefore, the chief priest, that's the Sadducees, and the Pharisees convened a council, that's the Sanhedrin. And we're saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. And in a sense, they are right. Jesus is saying, I am going to set up my kingdom. I will rule as a king here on earth. When we talk about his kingdom, he's referring to a literal kingdom where he will rule here on earth. Now, the Romans would not like that. The, they realize, this, the chief priests, the Pharisees, realize that the Romans will come with an army. They feel that the Romans will destroy Jerusalem and the nation. And by the way, what's mentioned first? They will take away our place, our positions that we have in our council, in the Sanhedrin. They're going to take away our position. And so we can't let this go on like this. We got to do something. And now we see some of the reasons for the conflict. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, says, don't you know anything? It is best for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. He's saying it's better to kill Jesus and save the whole nation. And in a sense, he's right, because Jesus died, all in the nation can have salvation. Then from that day forward, they plan together to kill him. Therefore, and this makes really sense, a lot of sense, therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the, the Jews. He went away to the country near the wilderness. He goes up north from Jerusalem to a place called Ephraim. And it's a small town on the edge of the wilderness. And there he stays with his disciples. He gets out of town before they come and arrest him and will kill him. However, now the Passover of the Jews was near. And many went up to Jerusalem outside the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus and they were saying, what do you think? Will he come to the feast at all? Why were they wondering about that? It says, Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone knew where he was, they were to report him and that they might seize him. Let's understand what's happening at, at one of these Passovers. This was not a small event. This was a Roman Empire. In fact, some people came from Parthia to these festivals. They were Jews. And that's what we would call today Afghanistan. That is outside the Roman Empire. Others would come from Italy, from Spain, North Africa. And so you would have in a town of maybe 40,000 people, 500,000 visitors. And they had come to obey the Lord, to worship on uh, Passover. 
That includes a Passover lamb that they will eat as a family. Now, how do you get 500,000 visitors in a town of 40,000? That's a bit of a problem. What the Jewish fathers did, they said when this happens, the city walls are not the limits of the city limit. The city limits will be beyond there and include a Mount of Olives. Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, says that at one of these feasts, the Mount of Olives was all filled with sheep. What he's saying is it looked that way because people would come and set up tents and that was a massive tent city. They would come and camp out. By the way, when Jesus is captured, it will be at one of his campsite there on the Mount of Olives. But they are coming, they're looking for Jesus. And Jesus is going to come and we will discuss this. Jesus' last conflict in Jerusalem. We will discuss this our next time together. Next question. I've uh, enjoyed reading your questions. My oh my, a lot of questions have come in, maybe multitudes of questions. The first question is, is halakha then the bigger collection, a collective of collections of extra laws and Mishnah a subset of halakha? Okay, um, no, let me tell you what the Mishnah is. We had the, uh, tradition of the elders and the oral law is the way we refer to that. That would be the way it is in the first century. After the time of Christ, about 40 years later, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That's going to be later on in the New Testament. When Jerusalem is destroyed, it will cease as a nation. That means the temple is destroyed just like Jesus predicted, and all of the ritual, how you do this and how you do that, and all of these rules in the tradition of the elders would be lost generation after generation after generation. So the Jewish leaders felt the need to write down these oral laws so they're not forgotten or so they're not changed in an inappropriate way. When they wrote it down, that collection became the Mishnah. And that was written about the year 200 or maybe 220 uh, as a result of that. But to put all of these uh, laws on writing so that they would continue on as they have even till today. Another question. Were Pharisees really required by law to marry. I don't know that. I have heard that. I have heard that it argued that basis of that, that Saul, that is Paul, must have had, had a wife. Um, there's a lot of discussion on this. We don't know. But see, he could have had a wife and his wife passed away. So we know very little about Jesus, or excuse me, Paul's family. We do know that he had a sister. And we know that because the sister had a, a boy, a nephew, who came to Paul and gave him some information. That is all we really know. Next question. In the book of Judges, there is a man called Micah. That's right. This is toward the end. But I don't think he is the prophet Micah. He hired a Levite as a personal priest. There was a man by the name of Micah. He was up north, not very far from uh, Dan, which is in the northern part. There's Micah of Morasheth. He is a prophet. He is some four or five centuries, maybe even longer later. And he is from the south west of Jerusalem. He's from a very different location. Uh, 
You're right. Micah hired a Levite as a personal priest, but that is in Book of Judges to explain how far the people had moved from what God's intent was when he made the law. Follow-up question. Does this mean that they were allowed to be employed as personal priests? The answer is no. That says even the priesthood at that time had was living for money and not as God intended. Next question. When and how did Pharisees begin? We don't know, but they, they began sometime after Malachi and before Matthew. They were very much in place. The, so, but it was a gradual thing over a couple centuries, as far as we know. We're very vague about that, and so I'm trying to be vague as well. Follow-up question, though. Why did they oppose Jesus? Or maybe I should say, why did Jesus oppose them? Their theology was this. They were the way to heaven. Their theology was right. Being rich makes you righteous. And Jesus is going to say in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor, not the rich. Blessed are those who mourn, not those who, are, who party. And he is going to say salvation is by faith, where the Pharisees would say that salvation is by works. And the Pharisees, among other reasons, rejected him because he was not a Pharisee. He's preaching something very different. Next question. Why the fear of being put out of the synagogue? Is it a loss of salvation to the Jews? Put it out of the synagogue sometimes is translated excommunicated. What it means is you are not allowed to go to the synagogue. You, uh, people would shun you. They, they wouldn't beat you up, but they would shun you. They would not buy from you. They would not talk from you. They would treat you as if you didn't exist. It was a very personal, relational thing. It was not necessarily a loss of salvation. It was assumed that if you were there, that you wouldn't be going to heaven anyway. Another question. John 9, 22 through 24. Actually, John 9, verse 22. It says, the Jews were trying to put, uh, or had said that they would put somebody out of the uh, synagogue. They would excommunicate him. Those were the Jewish leaders. Uh, the Jewish people did not have that option. The Jewish leaders, especially the Pharisees, and that's the context here, the Pharisees would be very interested and ability to command people who would be and who would not be excommunicated. Next question. Well, you guys got some good questions here. Did the Jews have any notion about mortal sins which would surely lead to hell, and other sins would be forgiven. Well, that's going to take a little time of explaining, but that's going to be important because we're going to talk about this uh, tomorrow as well. They had what they would define as ceremonial sins, and that was something for which you needed to pay for, but you could go and be forgiven for that. But there are other kinds of sins with which would be uh, sins of the will, where you chose to sin. David and Bathsheba, that would be a chosen sin. And there was no sacrifice in the Old Testament for those kinds of sins. And in both cases, they knew that someday they would have to pay both for the unintentional and the intentional sin. In fact, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, means the Day of Covering. The sins were not taken away. They were covered. And when your sins were covered, you knew that you had another year until the next Yom Kippur, but you also knew that your sins were not forgiven. You could only hope in Jeremiah 31, when Jeremiah prophesied it, there's some day coming where your sins will not be covered. They will be taken away. That was your hope. Someday in the future, 
God would take away for the sins. But not meanwhile, when I die, I still got the sin problem. Next question. Is that the only occasion Jesus uses names? Now we're talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And as far as parables go, yes, that's the only time in the Gospels where Jesus uses a name. Why would he use a name? Well, he could use a name like sometimes I might say Joe is coming and I'm referring to just anybody. But I think he used the name because he knew that, that within that week, he was going to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus would come back with that uh, testimony. So is Lazarus in Luke 16, the same Lazarus in John 11? I would say no, but in Jesus' mind, Jesus uses Lazarus knowing what's going to happen in the future. And so when he says, somebody goes back from the dead, they won't believe him. That's exactly what happened. Actually, we're going to get to that more uh, uh, tomorrow. So you come back for a more fuller answer. Another question. I wonder how the gospel writers had so much inside knowledge of what the Pharisees, Sadducees, or Sanhedrin discussed. What Caiaphas said, which you quoted. Actually, John quoted. Could it be that through Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and a member of the ruling council? The answer is yes. You got to remember, Joseph of Arimathea was also part of the Sanhedrin, and he could have given information. Scripture also says a number of the priests, now it says in the book of Acts, but a number of priests came to faith in Christ, and they would have record of what happened during that time as well. By the way, this is an important question because tomorrow we're going to talk about the Jesus before the Sanhedrin, and you're going to ask the same question. Where did he get those details? And that's going to be maybe from Nicodemus, Joseph Arimathea. We don't know, but there's very logical ways that they could have gotten that. Another question. Why Jewish leaders were worried about the Romans would come and take away them if many people believed in Jesus do the miracles he performed? Should they become more uh, powerful since Jesus is a Jew? Well, the Jewish leaders, they knew that Jesus was powerful because they saw the miracles. But if Jesus became king, they know that they would lose their position. If the Romans came, they thought that the power of the Romans would more than destroy the power of the Jews. In 70 AD, that is one that's going to happen. And the Jews would be destroyed as a nation, something like what they said. And when the Romans came, the powerful people excuse me, did lose their positions. So what they were thinking is right. They just not, did not trust that Jesus was strong enough to uh, counteract the, the Romans. What does it mean to be blessed by those who mourn? Blessed means happy. Happy are those who mourn. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. We're in uh, Matthew chapter 5 now. And this is what we talked about last week. But the Pharisees would say, happy, blessed are those who party, who have the money. And the Lord's going to say, no, those people are not going to go to heaven. He's going to say, in fact, if your righteousness is not much more, a great deal more than those, you're going to go to hell like they are. But those who are mourned, those that don't have the money, therefore, they have to trust in another way to get to heaven. And many of them will trust in Jesus by grace through faith plus nothing. And will get to heaven that way, not the way the Pharisees think they're going to get there. Next question. As Christians, we know that we are saved through faith in Jesus, the Messiah. Correct. How about those people who came before Christ? How are they saved? Well, this question sometimes is phrased a different way, and I'm not trying to uh, change what your question is because it's a good one. How were people saved in the Old Testament? 
because we know about Jesus, but they really didn't know about Jesus. Salvation in the Old Testament and the New Testament are the same. If they were different, Jesus didn't need to come and die because you could be saved the Old Testament way. They were saved the same way. How? By grace through faith plus nothing. For instance, in the Old Testament, you would say, I trust that God in the future will take away my sins. Now, they may not understand how that happened, but they trusted by grace through faith plus nothing that God in the future somehow will take away the sin, just like it was promised by Jeremiah. New Testament, we become saved exactly the same way, by grace through faith plus nothing, looking back at what Christ did to take away our sins. Now, we are fortunate because we have more details than what they had. But we're looking at this, trusting the same thing, God, to take away our sins somehow, we understand more than they did, but they trusted that God would do it. We trust that God did do it. Just looking a different direction, but in both cases, by grace, through faith, plus nothing. In the Gospels, there are often references to the Pharisees and the scribes. Were the scribes also part of the Sanhedrin? How did the scribes relate to Jesus' in the New Testament? The scribes were people who copied the scriptures. You remember back then they did not have Xerox machines. They did not have books like we have. If you want a copy of Isaiah, for instance, it was all handwritten. And it took for a normal farmer, for instance, it'd take a year's salary to buy that. So people did not have their own Bibles or books of the Bible. What they did as a synagogue, they would buy a piece of scripture as a synagogue and keep it in the synagogue for everybody to read. And the scribes were the ones that copied it. Well, if you spent all your day copying the book of Leviticus, after about 10 or 20 years, you would know Leviticus really, really well. And that would be true of the scribes. They would be experts in the context or the content of the Old Testaments. And often they are connected with the Pharisees. Now, were they part of the Sanhedrin? The answer is sort of yes and no. They were not part of the Sanhedrin because they were, because they were scribes. They may have had some scribes part of the Sanhedrin because they were Pharisees. And it was the Pharisees part that got him in the Sanhedrin, not the scribes part. I hope that that helps a little bit. In John 11, 51 and 52, Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and also gather the children of God. May I know if Caiaphas believed that Jesus is God's son? No, he did not. And we will come across Caiaphas again in the New Testament or in the book of Acts. If not, and the answer is not, then how does it make sense for him to say that Jesus is to gather the children of God? He is prophesying. He doesn't realize he's prophesying, but God can sp speak. God can prophesy through, Old Test or through unbelievers as well. Let me give you an example. He prophesied through Balaam. Balaam was a false prophet, but God opened his mouth and prophesied about the nation Israel through him. God can speak through whoever he wants. Remember in the same story, God spoke through Balaam's donkey. Why was the rich man in place of torment and Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham? Jesus had not died for the sins of man. All right, we're going back to what we're gonna talk about tomorrow, but this is good for it. It gives me a chance to set up for tomorrow a little bit. In the Old Testament, as they understood it, people, when they died, they went to the center part of the earth. Now, I explain, you got a shovel. You wouldn't get to the center part of the earth if you dug for a thousand years. 
But that's also true of heaven. We talk about heaven being up, but we know that you got a rocket, you're not going to get to heaven. It's another dimension. But they saw Sheol as a place of uh, the dead. Old Testament word is Sheol. New Testament word is Hades. The Greek word is Hades. The, old, the, the Hebrew word is Sheol. They just didn't translate it. And there were three parts to the place of the dead. There's the good part, Abraham's bosom or paradise. There's a bad part uh, where there's punishment. And there's a, a part in between to make sure there's a separation. That's the geography that we got in the story of rich man and Lazarus as well. But in the Old Testament, when people died, it always said they went down to Sheol. It was considered, that's the way they look at it. When we talk about people dying, we, we said, well, he's a believer. He went up to heaven. Well, we really mean he went to heaven. But since they believed in Jesus, or not Jesus, but the Old Testament saints believed in God, and belief gives them, a, they become a believer, they were put in a place that is pleasant, Abraham's bosom. But it's not heaven. So they died to a pleasant place. They did not have torment. They did not have torture. But they could not go to heaven until their sins were forgiven. And that would happen on the cross. So we're going to see that when Jesus died on the cross, many people, obviously Old Testament believers, were resurrected. And I give you more detail, but since I'm going to give that tomorrow, you come back tomorrow. But Abraham's bosom is different than heaven. Jesus on the cross is going to say to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. That's Friday. So Friday night, Jesus is with the thief in paradise. Friday morning, one of the women come to me, uh, to Jesus, and they say, and Jesus says what? Don't cling to me. I have not yet been to my father in heaven. He's been to paradise. He's now resurrected, but he is on his way to heaven. So paradise and heaven got to be two different things. But we're going to explain that tomorrow. Another question. Could the way Jesus sometimes or often answered the tricky questions of the Pharisees in an oblique way be the example of Proverbs 26, 4 and 5? Don't answer a fool according to his folly. Yes, that could be true. However, as you spend more time, it doesn't seem that Jesus is answering them, uh, these people, in an oblique way. Often if we have questions, it's because we don't understand the question. We don't understand the test. And we're going to talk about some of that tomorrow as well. For instance, they asked him, um, shall we pay our taxes? That's a trick question. Because if he says yes, then the, the crowd's going to go against him. If he says no, the Romans are going to come and get him. So if he answers yes, if he doesn't answer no, he's dead. He doesn't answer obliquely. He's very clear. He says, show me a coin. They show him a coin. He says, whose picture's on this? Well, that's Caesar's picture. He says, why do you Jews want to keep Caesar's picture? The Old Testament law says you shouldn't have any graven images. This is a graven image. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God. And the Pharisees who asked the, answered the, asked the question, they had no answer to that. He answered it clearly so that the crowd understood. Now, we don't understand because we don't go and study it enough, don't look in the background enough. Uh, another example, I'll give some more, but we're going to get into some of that tomorrow. Uh, one more question, maybe. If someone in the world didn't have a chance to know Christ, does that mean he or she won't be able to uh, get his or her salvation? Well, a lot of people did not know Christ, but are in heaven good example would be Abraham. He did not know Christ. He did not know Jesus. But by faith, he trusted in 
what God would do. Another example would be Melchizedek, who was a godly priest, but he did not understand Jesus' ministry. I think your question is, what about those who have not heard? And uh, I'll give you a real quick answer. The answer really is detailed in Romans chapter 1, the last 22 or 23 verses, uh, 16 or 18 verses, sorry. But that is, Again, you don't have to know about Jesus. You need to have faith that God will take you uh, away to heaven and take care of your sin. And you can know that outside of Scripture. And the answer is you don't need the Bible to understand that. Remember, Abraham did not have the Bible. Melchizedek didn't have the Bible. Uh, Noah didn't have the Bible but they trusted God. All right. One more question. This is it. You guys got so many questions. You come back tomorrow, we might take an hour or two to answer all the questions. Does Jerusalem hold the most rejection of Jesus in Israel today as in the past? Can you share more about the spiritual climate in Israel today? Um, Yeah, I can. You have several groups of people there. You have some that are Muslims, and a number of Muslims have Jewish passports. And some of them, if they desire, and some of them do, they fight in the military. And some of those Muslims are officers in the military. And I think, at least in the past, I don't know today, some of a couple of them have even become generals. They're very pro-Israel although they're Muslim. I know it's hard for us to believe that, but that's true. You have a lot of secular Jews, secular Jews of people who are Jewish, and they will celebrate the Passovers like we celebrate holidays. Sometimes holidays aren't even Christian holidays, but we'll celebrate them anyway. We'll take time off. It doesn't mean that uh, we believe what those uh, Muslim holidays mean, but it does mean that we celebrate. You have a number of those. They would not know very much at all about scripture. Um, That's not a big deal to them. Uh, That they are Jewish, they're proud of that, and that is good. Uh, One incident, I was up at um, uh, a spring, the spring of Herod, where you have the story of Gideon, and there were about 50 uh, Jewish soldiers there, and I talked to the commander and said, I want some pictures here. And he says, I'll get some of my guys to pose about along the the stream and explain how that Gideon did this and how some drank one way, some drank another. And then when I was finished, he says, that's interesting. Where'd you get that story? And I said, I got it from uh, the book of Judges. He says, really? I says, do you want me to tell your men that? He says, yes. And so I went and I talked to the men and I told them the story of Gideon. 50 men, give or take a little bit. None of them knew that story. So you have a lot of secular Jews like that. Now you have what we would call the sacred Jews or the Orthodox, and they dress in black and white, a lot of black, and they dress in black because they are still mourning the destruction of temple, of the temple. And they are the ones that follow very closely as much as they can. Of course, a lot they can't. But they're the ones that spend a lot of time studying Scripture. And they are the Orthodox. When I went to Jerusalem in uh, about 87, there were about 150 known Jewish Messianic believers. And we knew where they were. We, we knew where their, their little churches or Keila went. I went to one of them in Jerusalem. Now, there are about 15,000. That's 100 times. And they have two or three Keila in Tiberias alone. Other places, they have other churches of two or 300. Many of them have all their services in Hebrew. Now, that's, that's big. And the answer is it's also very small. 
for a, a country of 6 million, 15,000 is small. Well, that brings up a lot of other questions. I'm actually gonna turn this back over to Agnes, but uh, you come tomorrow and you ask more questions and we'll see if I got some answers. Agnes, take care. Dr. Keith, thank you so much. Everybody, do you know that Dr. Keith actually answered more than 25 questions within that short time? He has to speak really fast, but he has to think even faster. So can we just show Dr. Keith some love and some thumbs up and encouragement? Thank you, Dr. Keith, for such an engaging time tonight. Today we learned so much, and I think we will have even more to learn from you tomorrow. So we kind of are running out of time. And so we thank you for sharing tonight with us. And at the same time too, if you have more questions to ask Dr. Keith, you can write him directly at kschubert at east.edu.sg. Dr. Keith would be happy to answer your email and your questions. Some of you might have also signed up for our upcoming webinar this Saturday. The webinar is called Practical Christianity, and it's taught by Bishop Solomon. We'd like to inform you that the webinar will be held fully online now. And previously, we had said that it probably would be a hybrid, but um, it will be held fully online this Saturday at the same time from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Information will be sent to those of you who have already signed up for the webinar. Next, Crew Media has recommended these good resources on the topics related to these two webinars by Dr. Keith. So do check out these books currently selling at a promo price for a limited time. You've heard a lot from Dr. Keith tonight. It is also uh, East Asia School of Theology, 30th birthday, and the school is offering her regular semester classes for audit at a special rate of only $30 per class. There are many causes that you can choose from and I encourage you to log on to the East website to find out more and discover what you can learn. I'm sure many of us have benefited uh, from Dr. Keith's teaching last week as well as tonight. And here's a good piece of news for you. Dr. Keith, who is East Asia School of Theology's resident faculty will be conducting at least four different classes this semester. The first class will be the physical setting of the Bible. It will be a five session class on selected Thursday evenings from 7 to 9.15 p.m. It will be a in-person and a on-site class uh, at East Asia School of Theology. So sign up quickly if you're interested to find out more uh, about the physical setting of the Bible. It will be a very informational class. Next, Dr. Keith, and uh, Jeanette Schubert will be leading a Holy Land study tour at the end of the year from the 27th of November to 11th of December. If you're interested to join Dr. Keith and Jeanette, do write to study tour at east.edu.sg to find out how you can participate. I'm sure that after you've heard so much from Dr. Keith, you know that if you go on a trip with him, you would learn even more standing at the place that he's talking about. The next course that Dr. Keith will be teaching uh, this semester will be the New Testament narrative. It will be held on Thursday afternoons beginning mid-July. Finally, Dr. Keith will also be teaching a Bible study method and hermeneutics class. You can come and learn from him how you can read and interpret the Bible accurately not just for gaining information, but really for your life transformation. All these causes and how to register for them can be found on the East website. And you can also find out other causes that you can attend. So don't miss this opportunity to learn. Finally, I think um, most of you know that both Crew Singapore and East Asia School of Theology are both faith organization and we depend on the generous giving of donors and supporters to help fund our ministry activities as well as events. If you have benefited and would like to contribute to give to both Crew or East, you can actually uh, scan the QR code. Crew right now has a project called Love Burden 
that you can give to. And East has um, student scholarship and other ministry needs that you may like to help. So you can go ahead and scan the QR code for crew or for East respectively, if you'd like to give and contribute. Well, that's um, all that we have for tonight. Uh, we have collected some of the questions that did not uh, get answered tonight and hopefully we'll be able to cover them tomorrow. And like um, Dr. Keith says that come back tomorrow and find out what actually happened. Um, Jesus, uh, to Jesus on the cross, especially in the last six hours. I'm sure that you'll be excited to find out more in part two of Jesus in Conflict Jerusalem webinar tomorrow. So we hope to see many of you come back tomorrow night, same time, 8 p.m. You can log on using the same login ID that we have sent to you. So have a good evening and thank you again for joining us tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Gado Elohai Shiu ki gado Elohai Kol khadile ki gado Oh